Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. It is Thursday. So before we get we, we dive into our, our, our discussion about the coronavirus today, we have to close the loop about uh, Nicki Minaj's cousin's friend's swollen balls. You, you remember how it all started? Nicki Minaj tweeted out to her 22 million followers. My cousin in Trinidad won't get the vaccine because his friend got it and became impotent. His testicles became swollen. His friend was weeks away from getting married. Now the girl called off the wedding. Hmm. So just pray on it. Make sure you're comfortable with your decision, not bullied. Well, uh, this, of course, got a lot of attention um, in social media and on uh, cable television. Tucker Carlson actually read it on the air. Millions of people probably believe that it is true. I regret to tell you the story seems to be entirely bogus because yesterday the health minister of Trinidad, Tobago, held a press conference addressing this particular tweet. Let's listen in. Yes, so claims are being made. One of the reasons we could not respond yesterday in real time to Ms. Minaj is that we had to check and make sure that what she was claiming was either true or false. We did, we, and unfortunately, we wasted so much time yesterday running down this false claim. It is, as far as we know, at this point in time, there has been no such reported either side effect or adverse event. And what was sad about this is that it wasted our time yesterday trying to track down, because we take all these claims seriously, whether it's on social media or Mm. mainstream media. Great. As we stand now, there is absolutely no reported such side effect or adverse event Mm. of testicular swelling in Trinidad, or I dare say, Dr. Hines, anywhere else. None that we know of anywhere else in the world. Anywhere. So that's a so that's a claim. <laughs> that's and it gets that that is good news. Our guest today is Scott Gottlieb, the former commissioner of the FDA and the author of the new book, Uncontrolled Spread: Why COVID nineteen Crushed Us and How We Can Defeat the Next Pandemic. So, first of all, thanks for coming on the podcast, Doctor Gottlieb. Thanks for having me. So, how do we deal with a pandemic of this kind of disinformation? I mean, this this seems to be just a chronic problem of confronting this. I'm, I'm sure this is not the first time in history we've had this kind of disinformation, but it certainly feels like the first time that we've had so much, such loud echo chambers of just complete BS. Well, look, and it's also a function of um, social media and the different media streams that we have right now. I think there's less editorial control over the content that gets pushed mm-hmm. out. And so a story that has no basis in fact has the ability to reach a lot of consumers before you have some editorial scrutiny applied to it before you had, you know, effectively editorial gatekeepers who had a professional obligation to make sure that the information that consumers were receiving had been verified before they put it on networks, before they put it in newspapers. But now there's many streams of media that people get access to that don't have any editorial control. You know, I'm on the board, as you know, of Pfizer, um, Mm -hmm. and Pfizer has been the target of a a deliberate disinformation campaign that's been conducted by um, some adversarial countries. So some of this is being generated by people who are politically motivated. Some of it's just being you know, generated by people who have uh, certain intrigues and interests. And some of it is quite deliberate and, and the function of geopolitical forces as well. Huh. We know that the Russian government has been heavily engaged in a disinformation campaign against the Pfizer vaccine and other vaccines as well as part of their vaccine diplomacy in terms of trying to get their vaccine into certain markets ahead of ours. So what 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 form does this take? Actually, I'm I'm not really aware of of all of this. I should be, but so so the, the Russians and others uh, hostile nations have actually you know participated in this. Are, are they the source of it? Do they simply amplify it? How do they go about this? Both, and I think that there's there's a lot of streams of misinformation, and it's not all being you know supported by adversarial governments. A lot of this is being generated by commentators who aren't you know, in cahoots with anyone, they're, they're acting independently, but it just shows you, I think it, it sort of underscores the range of the disinformation. You've got disinformation coming from individual consumers and people who have longstanding standing 
um, concerns around medical products. You've got some of it coming from the mainstream media, um, as, as you've mentioned, and then you've got some of it that's quite deliberate coming from adversarial countries as part of a campaign to sow distrust and discord within the United States. And the, the issues around the Russian disinformation campaign has actually been well documented in the media. A hmm. um, couple of newspapers, New York Times, delved very deeply into this um, and showed how the Russian government or, or, or arms of the Russian government were using different channels that they had control over, in, including some um, journals that they maintain that have the veneer of reliability and veracity to push out you know, information that looked like official studies, looked like qualified mm. research. And then that would get picked up into social media and amplified. And then, you know, pretty soon you have, as it moves downstream, it starts to make its way into more conventional media. So th there's so many things that are happening now that are confusing to those of us who, you know, to, to, to laymen. But as, as you and I are speaking, uh, the number of COVID deaths has now reached about 1,900 a day, which is the equivalent of 9-11 every 38 hours. So give me your sense of the state of play right now. Where are we with this Delta wave? Yeah, and, and it's tragic to see what's going on around the country because a lot of these are avoidable deaths given the fact that we have th three safe and effective vaccines uh, that could forestall a lot of the disease and death that we're seeing. My belief is that um, we're much further into this Delta wave than perhaps we perceive at the moment. I, I think that the Delta wave has largely moved through the South. The only group in the South where you're seeing cases continue to rise is tragically school-age kids because as kids are returning to school, oftentimes without adequate mitigation in place because governors and others have made decisions not to allow, not to implement and mandate certain steps that we know can keep those environments safer. They're not inherently safe environments, but you can make them more safe. You're seeing large outbreaks in the schools. And so I think that's likely to continue. 29% of all the cases being diagnosed right now are in children. But mm. that's not going to offset the overall trend in the South where cases are coming down. They're probably going to start to come down very rapidly. You're seeing that in certain states. I think the big question is what happens in the north? What happens in the northeast? What happens in the Great Lakes region? Is there enough vaccination and enough immunity from prior infection to forestall a big delta wave? I'm of the opinion that that we're going to see a delta wave in the northeast and the north. I I'm, I live in the northeast. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be anywhere near um, as severe as what we saw in the south. But cases are going to pick up as kids return to schools and the schools become sources of community transmission, like we saw in the springtime in Michigan and, and Massachusetts when they reopened schools. We saw very dense outbreaks in those states because the schools became sources of community transmission. As people start to return to work, as the weather gets cold and people start to move indoors, I think you're going to see Delta infections pick up and the North is going to have to go through its Delta wave as well. There's a perception that there was this sort of mini Delta wave in the summertime you know, New York, if you look at the figures in New York, New York had about 20 cases per 100,000 per day at the peak of their, you know, Delta wave in the summer at the same time that the South states like Florida were having 110, 120 cases per 100,000 people per day. There's a perception among some that that was our Delta wave. I think that that was our Delta mm. warning. I think our Delta wave is yet to come. Now, final thought on the back end of this. <sighs> Mm. I do think that this is the last major surge of infection that we're going to have. We're, and then we're going to start to move into more of an endemic pattern where this is just going to be a persistent risk. And we're going to have to figure out how to reorder society culturally at a practical level just to mitigate this risk on a, on a go forward basis. But hopefully this is the last major wave of infection. We're going to see new variants, but we're going to be able to deal with them more more effectively. Okay, I want to come back to that in, in just a moment. But at the, at the moment, well, let's talk about this uh, this Delta wave that we're we're facing. You um, you were on CNBC a, just a little while ago, and you said that uh, that you know kids back in school will be incubators for the spread, and, and you recommended that schools test once or twice a week. What what else can we do in the schools to prevent this explosion among children? Yeah, look, our goal has to be to keep children safe first and foremost, and our second goal is to keep kids in school for in class learning because we know that socially, it's educationally important. Schools aren't inherently safe environments, but they can be made a lot more safe if you're willing to put in place the elements that could create some safety around that activity. The two um, interventions that we know are the most effective based on some of the literature that's come out is keeping kids in defined social pods. So not letting the whole class intermingle, but keeping kids within hmm. a geographic pod, typically around their class. 
and in implementing testing, ideally twice a week testing, routine screening of asymptomatic um, kids, just screen the entire population at least once a week, ideally twice a week. Masks help as well. And the higher the quality mask that you can put on a child, the better protection they're going to be afforded. So a procedure, a level three procedure mask, which are hard to get, but they're available for children is better than a cloth mask, a KN95 mask, which can be comfortable to wear. Um, it's, it's an ear loop mask. So it's not like an N95 mask that that's going to afford more protection than an, than a procedure mask. So trying to get a higher quality mask on children and make sure that they're wearing masks more, more routinely. The one thing that schools aren't doing, even in the Northeast, where you're seeing, I think, more of a serious approach to trying to avoid outbreaks in the school setting than what we've seen in some Southern states is the routine testing. And it's not because they don't have the capacity to do it. The federal government, the Biden administration has made billions of dollars, more than $10 billion available to states to stand up routine screening using testing in schools. There's been companies that have come in, both not-for-profit like the Broad Institute or for-profit companies like uh, uh, Concentric by Ginkgo, and there's others who basically are coming into schools and saying, we'll offer you a turnkey solution. We'll, we'll bring the nurses to your mm. school. We'll bring the testing supplies, the testing equipment. We'll handle it all. You're still seeing schools not do it. And my presumption is, and this is anecdotal, but talking to school administrators is that they don't want to have to deal with the complexity of turning over the positive cases, that if they implement testing, they're going to find some asymptomatic cases. They're going to have angry parents. They're going to have, huh. have to do, you know, a follow-up testing to confirm the result. And there's a lot of politics around doing it that creates complexity that the districts just aren't, don't have the capacity to handle, which isn't very satisfying because it means no. that there, if there's cases that are happening, you know, it's sort of don't ask, don't tell it. They don't want, they don't want to really know about it. So I, I think if we could be testing more regularly, it could keep schools much more safe. And in final point, and I'll pause here, yeah, yeah. a lot of the criticism from the political right, and I, you know, I, you know, I work at a conservative think tank, so I'm in touch with people from the uh, conservative side of the spectrum. The, the criticism I get when I advocate testing in the schools is that it's just going to lead to mass quarantines, uh, unnecessary quarantines. It's actually the exact opposite. Yeah. States like North Dakota, Utah are using testing to keep kids in the class. They have what's called, you can Google it, test to stay. So they have these protocols in place where when they have a positive case, rather than quarantining the whole class, um, what they do is they test everyone in the class on a regular basis and mm -hmm. they keep the kids in the classroom. My kids are actually home this week because there was a case in the class and now they're in quarantine. But what they could have done is kept the kids in school and just tested them serially every day to make sure that that index case didn't lead, lead to some downstream infections. That's test to stay. That's what Utah is doing successfully. North Dakota, uh, other states are doing it as well. This is fascinating. Um, and, and there's also been, you know, moving off of schools. Do we have enough rapid tests in, in other areas? Because as you point out, if you have more testing, you can keep people at work. You can keep people traveling. There are all sorts of things. And yet I, I have heard complaints that it's difficult to get for, for individuals, you know, to, to roll into CVS or Walgreens and get instant at, at home tests. Where, where are we at on, on that? There's a lot of testing supplies available. We don't have a shortage in the testing supply chain. We, we do have a shortage of the tests that people prefer. So some of the tests that are easier to use mm -hmm. um, are in shortage. So like the Binax now by Abbott is a very good test, uh, very easy to use. It's what I use at home, but that is in shortage. Uh, Abbott, did, Abbott scaled production enormously, but then there was a perception that COVID wasn't going to be the same risk it was. And so production was pulled back. And now we have a shortage of those tests. So they're hard to get. If you go into a Walgreens where they're still available, they'll limit you to four tests. So mm -hmm. there's two tests in a box. They'll limit you to four boxes. There's a lot of other tests that are available. Some of them are less, they're either more expensive, like the Lumera test, which is a molecular test that you can do at home, but it's $50 for a test versus mm -hmm. the Binex, which is about $12.50. And then others require you to send the sample off to a lab and then get the result back the next day. And consumers, you know, that's not as convenient. Yeah. So if you go on to Amazon right now, Amazon offers at cost for about $34 a test where you can self swab, put it in an envelope, mail it out, and you get the result back the next day, but you have to wait. All right. So, you know, on, on the issue of, of, of testing, there's a couple of other things that I'm, I'm a little bit confused about. Um, 
Where do you come down on the question of booster shots? Because we're coming up to that period where many of us are, you know, beyond six months. Uh, we're reading reports out of Israel uh, that uh, you know, that our immunity is has, has has been declining. You know, should there be an, an aggressive effort to uh, provide booster shots to people over the age of I don't know sixty or whatever? Yeah, so FDA is meeting on this very question. They're going to um, make a, a judgment, and then CDC is ultimately going to take FDA's judgment and um, make a decision about issuing a recommendation to the general public. Um, Pfizer, the company I'm on the board of, has applied for uh, boosted doses to be made available. I think where we're, we're going to come out is that boosters are probably going to be made available for a certain portion of the population. It's likely to be age-based. It's likely to be people over the age of 60 or 65 who are uh, a certain length of time out from receiving their original vaccination. That seems to be what the data shows um, is the group that's most vulnerable, where you see the sharpest decline in vaccine efficacy, Mm -hmm. and where there's evidence that you could be providing a benefit to that group in the form of added protection. A lot of data on this comes out of Israel. It's real world evidence. We don't have a lot of good data coming out of the US because quite frankly, the CDC isn't adequately collecting it. I think the the debate and the controversy in the public health community, there's there's a a couple of different threads of, of debate around boosters. But I think that the bottom line debate is that the original premise of the vaccines were that they were going to protect you from severe disease and hospitalization. We ultimately learned that the vaccines were highly effective at also protecting you against even asymptomatic infection and preventing transmission of the infection. What we have seen over time, particularly as the vaccine ages, so if you're eight or nine months out from Mm -hmm. the vaccination, if you're older And in the setting of Delta, which is a far more contagious variant, what we're seeing is more breakthrough infections. People are getting mild infections. In some cases, they're getting symptomatic infections despite being vaccinated. But we're still seeing the vaccines offer significant protection against um, severe disease and hospitalization. And so people argue, some in the public health community argue, why should we provide boosters to the entire population? It's not risk-free. Anytime you're delivering a medical product to someone, there's Mm -hmm. risk associated with it. They, they worry that you're taking vaccine away from other uses of that vaccine, particularly outside the U.S. I disagree with that. I don't think it's a zero-sum game, but that's the argument. So they argue, why would we provide boosters when the vaccines are fulfilling their original promise, which was that they would prevent severe disease and hospitalization, which they're continuing to do? So that's where I see the debate falling out. Now, the reason I think 60 and above makes sense is because I think the data is compelling that there is a decline in efficacy, that you're seeing more breakthrough in cases and more symptomatic cases. You're dealing with a population that's very vulnerable, particularly when you're talking about a nursing home population. You're dealing with a community that's not just vulnerable by virtue of advanced age, but also by virtue of where they live. People who live in congregate settings we know are very vulnerable to this infection because once it gets into those settings, it spreads very quickly. So I think what I think it makes sense to provide the boosters into that population. Now, whether or not we start walking it down to younger age groups, I don't know what FDA is ultimately going to judge. I would if someone was asking me to handicap where they come out, I would say they come out at 60 and above now, and then they mm-hmm. reconvene at some later point after they collect more evidence and look at the younger the younger age groups, whether or not boosters make sense after a, a greater interval of time. So that's how I would handicap this debate. That's where mm-hmm. I think it comes out. But, you know, it's open to, it's an open question right now. So you mentioned the the FDA and you're a former commissioner of of the FDA. Could could you clarify something for me? I, I guess I I mean I want the FDA to be as careful as as possible. I want them to get it right, obviously. Um, I, I guess I am I am puzzled about why there would be an approval for Pfizer, but not so far. I mean a you know official non emergency approval, uh, but not so far for Moderna. Obviously, I'm, I'm biased because I, I'm a Moderna, uh, <laughs> have the Moderna vaccine, but um, we have so much data, so much research. What what is the what's the internal holdup, or is that even an unfair question? Yeah, I mean, the, the bottom line is I don't know. Um, I'm much closer, obviously, to the issues around the Pfizer application um, being on the board of the company. Um, I, I know Moderna got their application in after Pfizer, so there was there's just sort of that time interval. Um, You know, whether or not there's issues where the FDA is waiting on certain data from the company, I'm just not privy to that. On the issue of boosters in particular, um, the issue there, the reason why they're adjudicating the Pfizer application first 
And they've said that the Pfizer boosters may be authorized, if there are boosters authorized, ultimately the Pfizer booster may be authorized before before the Moderna. Um, Dr. Fauci has said that is because Moderna explicitly, and they've said this publicly, proposed to go with a lower dose for their boosters. So their vaccine right now is a 100 microgram dose. They've proposed to go with a 50 microgram dose as a booster, and that's going to require more data, more time for review. So that's the reason why there is a discrepancy in time around the boosters. Why the Moderna vaccine hasn't received the BLA, the license, and it's still being offered under an emergency use authorization, I don't, I'm not as close to that. Uh, there hasn't been public discussion around that. But, but one fact is that Moderna just filed after, after, after Pfizer. So just if, if FDA just takes sort of a normal sequence of time for each application, it's going to take longer to get to a result with the Moderna application. The, um, the, here, here's a question that, that may seem like a, a slight digression, but I've, I've heard it asked over and over again. So many of us have spent the last year and a half uh, essentially in a bubble. Um, you know, we've, we've been you know, quasi-quarantined. We've been, we've been locked down. And now we're emerging into the, the world are people who have not been out in the world, are, are they at more at risk of getting colds and the regular flu because they haven't, because their immune systems have not had a workout over the year and a half? Do you understand the question? Yeah, here? no. You, I, you, I, you, yeah. Okay. The answer is yes. I mean, yeah. the, the answer is yes. And we saw that. I think we saw some of the consequences of that with the very dense epidemic of respiratory syncytial virus in children that we saw this summer, um, where there was an epidemic of RSV in summertime, which you typically wouldn't see, RSV is typically a winter pathogen. That was probably because we didn't get immunity into the, the children for a year. And so RSV was able to course its way through that population um, with a lot of efficiency. The, the big worry in the public health community right now is that we haven't gotten immunity into the population for influenza in one and maybe two years. We might have another right. mild flu season this year. And so we're going to be due for a whopper of a flu season at some point in the future uh, once we sort of lift this mitigation and flu comes back right now, it, it, it's it's the case that all the things we're doing to prevent covid while they work against covid, but obviously not as well as right. we'd like. They work really well against flu, something that spreads through droplet transmission. If you're going to wash your hands a little more and wear a mask and, you know, just kind of keep your distance from people, you're going to dramatically impact something that spreads through droplet transmission. It's not as effective against something that spreads through aerosols like this does. So we're going to be due for a whopper of a mm. flu season. Uh, our, our guest today is Scott Gottlieb, the former commissioner of the FDA and author of the new book, Uncontrolled Spread, Why COVID-19 Crushed Us and How We Can Defeat the Next Pandemic. And I want to talk to you about um, going forward, the new normal, but also um, I, I think the most the most painful part about your book, which describes uh, you know, many of the you know, mistakes that were made early on, including by the CDC. Well, let's do this right after this. Thanks for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. And a special thank you to all of the Bulwark Plus members. We launched Bulwark Plus a year ago, and I don't think we really had any idea back then how fast it would grow or the kind of challenges we'd all be facing in the post-Trump era. If you've been listening to us or reading our newsletters, the in-depth pieces on our homepage, you know that we are committed to telling you what we think in a thoughtful, non-tribal way. But we're also not going to pretend these are normal times, and we're not afraid to try to make a difference here at The Bulwark. And we intend to keep fighting because the challenges to democracy are more urgent than ever. None of this would be possible without your support, and we're very grateful. If you haven't signed up yet for Bulwark Plus, please consider becoming part of the Bulwark community. And if you already have, thanks. We think you're in great company. We're back with Scott Gottlieb, former commissioner for the FDA, author of the new book, Uncontrolled Spread. So let's look back on how this, this happened. And um, in, in fairness, you flagged early on, this is not simply, uh, you know, a, a, after the fact, second guessing, you, you flagged many of the failings of the CDC, particularly in getting testing, uh, to standing up testing. So talk to me about um, what went wrong early in this that might have, that might have contributed to us being crushed by COVID-19. Yeah, well, I think a lot of our our early challenges, you know, setting aside the, the political shortcomings, just focusing on the sort of practical challenges that we faced. I think a lot of our early challenges stemmed from the fact that we didn't have a diagnostic test that we could deploy uh, 
to not just know where the virus was spreading, but know where it wasn't spreading. So that when we applied our mitigation, when we told businesses they had to shut down and people had to stay at home, we didn't have to tell the whole country that they had to shut down. We could have told the parts of the country where the virus was, and then we could have preserved our political capital to shut down other parts of the country when the virus eventually got there. But instead, we had to implement the national stay-at-home order when the virus was only in certain parts of the country because we had, we had no diagnostic tests and we couldn't tell. We assumed it was everywhere, even though even though at that time it wasn't. So what went wrong? Well, we just we, we had the wrong process for developing a diagnostic test. We assumed wrongly that CDC would develop a test, that they would deploy it to labs, that the labs would start running the test, and we'd go through this sort of really sequential process to deploy testing across the country when, in fact, we needed a very rapid, um, all-of-the-above approach to tr- getting as much testing into the market as possible. So that sequential process historically had CDC developing a test. They would deploy it to the public health labs. There's 100 public health labs in the country. Each of them have the capacity to perform 100 tests a day. So that's 10,000 tests a day that could be performed. If that's not enough testing, then then the, the test would be given to clinical laboratories and academic health centers. They would start doing testing. And if that still wasn't enough testing, then we would turn to commercial manufacturers and they would mass produce test kits that could be used in commercial labs across the country. By CDC's own proposal for how this was going to unfold, this was a six-month process by virtue Mm. of their plan. We needed a a six-day process. We needed to turn to commercial manufacturers right away and get them spun up mass-producing tests. And the other problem was that if the commercial manufacturers wanted to just make tests on their own, if they said, you know what, we think this is going to be a crisis, we're not going to wait for CDC to ask us to make the test, we're just going to start doing it. They needed access to two things. They needed access to viral samples in order to design a test. CDC wouldn't give it to anyone. They didn't start sharing viral samples to the end of February. And if they wanted to use the CDC's test design to copy it, because they didn't want to develop their own design, which would have taken a lot of time, CDC was making them sign licensing agreements, um, intellectual property agreements that were very cumbersome. And I had talked to some companies at the time, and they said, it's taking us weeks to negotiate with CDC. We're just going to wait. I mean, we can't, we don't have the Mm. time. We don't have the lawyers to do this. So CDC basically created a catch-22. They they said, if you want to use our test design, you've got to license it from us. But if you want to create your own test, you're going to need access to viral samples, and we're not going to give it to you. So they basically froze everyone out of the market. Someone had to, if, for this to actually work right, because it's not all CDC's fault. They they were never going to be able to operationalize this. And you know, to their you know, to their criticism, you know, to they didn't raise their hand and say, guys, we don't have this. I mean, they should have sort of self-identified that they weren't going to be able to fulfill the need. But someone in politi- in a political leadership position needed to sometime in January pick up the phone, call the major manufacturers of diagnostics and say, we're worried about this. We need you to get into the game. We need you guys to start making um, diagnostic tests. We know it's going to take four to six weeks for you to actually spin up manufacturing and design those tests. You need to start doing it now. Certainly by the end of January, when the Chinese government was shutting down the Ube province, we should have had an inclination that this could be bad. If China was willing to crush its entire economy to try to keep this virus in check, that should have been a pretty strong tip off to us that maybe we need to start over investing in preparations. And that was by the end of January, we really didn't get the commercial manufacturers spun up till the end of February, early March. The, the Wall Street Journal has a, has a really uh, excellent review of your book, and they highlight this particular issue. Uh, at times, uh, the CDC seemed more interested in its own intellectual property than in saving lives. In a jaw-dropping section, Dr. Gottlieb writes that, quote, companies seeking to make the, the test kits described extended negotiations with the CDC that stretched for weeks as the agency made sure the contracts protected its inventions. So you, you just described that. I, I This is breathtaking to me because you you would think that uh, this is the CDC's mission, right, to, to c- combat this. Clear, the threat was clear, and yet something in the mentality, I, how do you, I mean, wh- what's the psychological bureaucratic diagnosis here? <laughs> I mean, what, what what was going on in their heads? Put CDC on a couch. Um, yeah, look, would you help me? It, yeah. CDC is a high science organization that has a very retrospective mindset that's in the business. So there's two hmm. components of CDC. Let's just start at the top. There's the yeah. disease prevention component of CDC. That does, you know, how do we reduce heart disease? How do we um, reduce smoking? So that's more of the public health um disease prevention focus 
aspects of the agency. Then there's the other part of the agency that's the disease control. And that's what people think of. That's sort of the romantic part of CDC. Those are the people who go into, you know, West Africa in hazmat suits and sample the Ebola virus and bring it back for analysis. That's the epidemiological um, intelligence service, the people who go overseas. That component of CDC and all of the agency really has a very retrospective mindset. It's a high science organization that does careful analyses and publishes, you know, the exquisite scientific work in the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. CDC will tell us how bad this Delta wave has been in about four months, and they'll publish it in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it will be very exquisite. Mm. Policymakers need information in the moment to make decisions. CDC is not in the business of providing actionable information you know, we needed sort of a joint special operations command for public health. We had the Harvard School of Public Health. I mean, that's that's in the CDC. So in terms of being able to deploy a diagnostic test and 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 do things at the scale required to, to combat an, a national epidemic, CDC has no capability. They're not a logistical organization. They can't, they can't work quickly. The guidance they put out is largely uninterpretable to consumers. Um, it's not, they don't define the scientific basis for the guidance they issue. So oftentimes it seems arbitrary. They don't put out real time information. The information they do put out is actually, uh, modeled. It's not, it's, it's, they sample information. They put out estimates off models. So when they say that this number of people are hospitalized for COVID or this number of people died of COVID, that's not a point estimate. If they say, so I'll give you an example, you know, you go to the CDC's website right now and you look at the 2017, 2018 flu season, and it'll say that 80,000 people, 427 died of flu. It's somewhere around that number, but that's not actual, actual data. They, they don't know that 80,000 people died. If you look at the confidence interval, it's, it's a range of like 60,000 to 100,000. Why? Because they collect data from about 1,000 of the 6,000 hospitals in this country, and they estimate how many people died or how many people are hospitalized off of a small sample set. When you have a fast-moving pandemic, that's, that's okay for normal times when you have sort of a historical baseline average you can compare against, like with flu. But when you're dealing with a fast-moving pandemic and you're putting out estimates off of a small sample size and and the epidemics being experienced in a highly regionalized basis, that's not reliable. So we actually didn't have good estimates on how many people were even being hospitalized for COVID in the outset of this pandemic. So you fundamentally need a different organization. You need an organization with a national security mindset. And, I, and my argument isn't that CDC is incapable of being that organization, but you need to really reimagine CDC. You need to build in new capacities, new culture, new new resources, a new mission set in order to have an agency capable of both the real-time information and analytics that are required in a crisis, as well as the operational capability. Well, this was one of my big takeaways from from, from your book is that is that what we have now just doesn't work. It's not going to protect us in the future. So are we fixing this? And are you optimistic that we will, in fact, respond because there will be more pandemics and they may be more severe. So what is your what's, what's your level of optimism slash hope that, in fact, we will um, make the changes necessary to confront the next wave? Well, we're not fixing it right now. I think that no. there is more of a recognition of the shortcomings, um, particularly of CDC and You know, the fact that we made a mistake by over relying on the agency and thinking that they had capabilities that they never really had. I think that in the public health community, there's a reluctance to criticize CDC because it's sort of the temple of public health. And if you criticize CDC, you're criticizing the public health establishment. But I think that we will get to a place where we start doing the after action analysis and ask the question, what do we need to do differently to prepare for the future? I'm actually surprised that hasn't happened yet. I mean, my book really was an attempt to try to be part of that debate. I thought that debate would be happening by now. You know, the, my most charitable um, analysis of that is that maybe it's too soon. You know, maybe we can't talk about how to prevent the next pandemic because we're still in the current pandemic mm-hmm. and, and we'll get to this. But you know, the fact that we haven't really started to even articulate and sort of envision what the process would be for answering these questions is a little bit discouraging right now. Yeah, it, it's it's obviously it's much more complex than whether we, quote unquote, believe the science or not believe the science. I think sometimes these things get reduced down to bumper stickers. You know, do you follow the science as well? It's com- it's complex. And sometimes you have science and sometimes you have scientific bureaucracies. Right. So it's it's it is it's not it's not a black and white situation. Well, you know, it's interesting the way you articulate that, because my my impression of CDC's general approach during the pandemic wasn't that 
you know, people always said we can't get ahead of the science. It wasn't we can't get ahead of the science. It was we can't get ahead of CDC's interpretation of the science. Right. That was right. the attitude of the yeah. agency. Uh -huh. And I'll, I'll give you if you have I'll give you one yeah. anecdote. Early on, the, the the single costliest recommendation that CDC made through this whole uh, pandemic was the requirement for six feet of distancing. The reason why a lot of schools remained shut was they couldn't physically create six feet of distance between students. So they had to go to either hybrid models or or telelearning. Initially, CDC's recommendation, and this goes back to the Trump administration, was for 10 feet of distance. And a political official inside the White House said, there's no way we can make a recommendation that people have to stay 10 feet apart. We can't, people can't measure it. It's impractical. So the compromise was around six feet. Imagine if that had leaked out at the time, people would have wow. said, this, that's political interference in CDC. How dare you say CDC can't mandate 10 feet? We now know that even the six feet was arbitrary. They didn't have a good, a good basis for it. They never articulated what their basis, even to this day, they didn't explain why six feet. Most people assume that they derived it from studies looking at droplet transmission in the setting of influenza where six feet was an adequate distance. But we knew early on COVID was spreading through aerosols. They finally revised it, as you know, because the Biden administration put pressure on the agency to reconsider it because they recognized that the requirement for six feet was forcing schools to remain shut and they wanted to reopen schools in the springtime last spring. So CDC finally came to a determination that if children wear masks in schools, three feet can be adequate. The basis for that recommendation ended up being a study that they did in the fall, where they, the prior fall, where they had shown that if two masked individuals are three feet apart, you can reduce transmission by 70%. But it begs the question, if they did that study in the fall and they had that analysis and that analysis ultimately formed the basis of their revised recommendation, why didn't they revise their recommendation in the fall? Why did they wait until the spring to do it? So the whole thing had a very arbitrary feel to it. Uh. And so to argue that it's, quote, science based. Mm -hmm. Yes, science informed it. But this was ultimately an, a judgment made on partial information that w wasn't you know, didn't have a strong fact pattern where it really wasn't, you know, even properly defended in public. The, the information that underlied it wasn't properly articulated so that people could say why this is important is people need to be in a position to say, OK, CDC says six feet, but but they haven't provided a strong basis. We're <laughs> going to make a decision to go with three feet. Um, you, you need to be able to interpret how these recommendations are made so you can make a judgment about which ones you're going to follow more religiously than others. Well, that, that does make it more complicated. All right. So as you mentioned earlier in the podcast, this pandemic is going to be over at a certain point, the Delta surge, you know, maybe the last big destructive wave, wave but but it's not finished with us. And, and you wrote a piece in The Atlantic th this week that that it's going to become this endemic virus and it's going to be a persistent menace. So we're going to have to figure out how to adapt, right, in you know, our work, our leisure activities to this virus that's now this, this new reality. It's not clear whether we're going to ever come up with a political, social, cultural consensus about it. But so talk about some of the, the, the possible changes in, in work life mandates, more telework, more Zoom meetings, um, you know, office buildings with improved airflow. What, what is it going to have? To, what will it take to, for us to learn to live with this? Yeah, and it's not just COVID that's going to re require us to have some kind of reordering um, of of life, and and reordering in a way where it can become routine. We, we're not gonna we're not gonna you know fundamentally change the way we live. But when this becomes an endemic risk, there's certain things we're going to have to do differently on the margins, at least in my view. And it's not just because of COVID; it's also because of flu. It's because the if we have COVID, which is going to probably have at least the amount of death and disease that flu causes each year circulating alongside influenza because we're going to continue to have flu seasons. The combined impact of those two viruses every winter in terms of uh, on people's lives, on productivity at, at, in the workplace is going to be too great for us to sustain it and be as complacent as we've been in the past about the risk of respiratory pathogens in the wintertime. We've been far too complacent about flu. We let it infect far too many people. We let it mm -hmm. kill too many people. We're not gonna be able to have the same complacency when we have both flu and COVID. And if you look at the data on the productivity impact, the actual direct and indirect costs on business, it's in the billions, tens of billions of dollars, depending on what study you look at. So what does it mean? I think it means that businesses are gonna have to think about how to de-densify the offices at peak COVID and flu season. They might go to you know sort of hybrid models for a couple of months a year. It means they'll move conferences to the fall and the spring. So you're not having conferences in the middle of January when sort of peak 
respiratory pathogen season. It means buildings that have been sealed shut tightly to make them more green are going to have to put in hospital grade air filtration and handling systems. So you have better airflow inside um, sealed spaces. It means when people are in the office, you're not going to be as apt to crowd 30 people into the conference room. Maybe you have people zooming into meetings even inside the office. And so you have some kind of hybrid interactions in the office space. It means masks are going to become more culturally acceptable. I think even if you don't mandate them, I think you're going to be seeing more people wearing masks on public transportation, on airplanes, things like that. Um, different parts of the country, you might have different cultural norms, but I don't think masks are going to be seen as unusual. There was a study done years ago that showed that if you wore a mask in public, the average distance people stayed away from you increased. So if you wore a mask, everyone <laughs> tried to stay away from you because they thought something right. was wrong with you. Right. Now, I don't think people are going to think that the person with the mask on is sick. They're just going to think the person with the mask on doesn't want to get sick. But won't the key also be vaccination? And, uh, you know, for example, I mean, I was, I'm, I'm invited to a party next month, um, you know, and and one of the big questions I'm going to have is, will they require people to be vaccinated to go into this into this into this event? Um, we know there's a big debate over businesses um, you know, requiring vaccinations. But if, in fact, that spreads, if we, we start to have 80, 90 percent of employees of companies being vaccinated, um, kids, a large number of children being vaccinated, isn't that going to get us around the bend? Won't that be the, the real key to all of this? Yeah, I think you're going to see um, vaccine mandates become more normalized, not just for COVID, but probably also for flu. You know, the idea of mandates, mandated vaccines for adults. For flu. Hmm. For flu as well. But the mm -hmm. idea of vaccine mandates for adults really wasn't common. You saw it in certain settings like healthcare. Healthcare workers have to get vaccinated for chickenpox and hepatitis. Um, but outside of the healthcare setting, you really didn't see a lot of vaccine mandates for adults. Most of the mandates are for children. I think you're going to see uh, mandates for adults being more common, particularly for COVID, but probably also for flu, because you're not going to want to have, have the burden in the wintertime of having to differentiate COVID from flu. And if you can reduce flu incidents, that's going to be, that's going to, be uh, to the benefit of a lot of people. Why has there been so much resistance to the the vaccination, particularly among children? Because in every state in the country that I'm aware of, uh, and not every parent knows this, uh, children have to have all sorts of, of you know, Im immunizations and vaccinations. And in Florida, the, it goes on for page after page. Why would people say that's OK, but I don't want children being vaccinated for this? What's the what's the what's the nub of that opposition, do you think? Yeah, I, I don't. I think it's hard to to distill down. I don't. I, I doubt that there's sort of one um, sort of pervasive sentiment. But I think it's a perception that this is still a new um, vaccine mm -hmm. for some people. So, you know, we've sort of made our peace with the existing childhood immunizations. People have come to accept them. They've been available for an extended period of time. But when you've seen new vaccines introduced into children, Gardasil, for example, one of the most recent vaccines, right. is, that was controversial at first. Very now it's a more routine vaccine. That That's part of it. And then there's another debate going on about how serious COVID is with kids. And I think different camps you know, are seizing on either one of those and maybe both of them to provide the rationale for why they would resist mandates. This will become part of the childhood immunization schedule. You know, once you have multiple approved vaccines for children, right now we don't have any approved vaccines for 12 uh, and under, uh, but once you have multiple vaccines approved for kids ages five to 12, um, ACIP, the advisory committee CDC, I believe will add this to the child immunization schedule. They won't do it until there's mm -hmm. a couple of vaccines available because they won't want to sort of hand a monopoly to one company. Um, and they won't do it until they're fully approved. But I wouldn't be surprised if by the fall of 2022, this, this goes into the childhood immunization schedule. Now, that's... Um, that doesn't mean automatically it becomes a mandated vaccine for schools. In, in a lot of states, they have to separately pass legislation to change their own immunization schedule. So this is going to be a, a state by state decision. But eventually, this is going to evolve towards vaccination, I think, across the country. And the final point on children, you know, the, clearly we've seen kids get into trouble with COVID. But thankfully, it's not nearly uh, mm -hmm. as deadly in children as it is in adults. If it was, this would be a whole different ballgame with this virus. But I think the the concern of a lot of public health officials is that we don't really know how dangerous this is in kids. We don't know what the long-term consequences. This is a virus that's very um, 
Wiley that's that's surprised us at every turn. Mm -hmm. That seems to be a more systemic virus than what we first expected. And so there's a concern that there are going to be long term consequences. And you see in some of the data, even kids having persistent neurological features, even if it's one or two percent, which is what some of the data shows, if you start infecting millions of kids and two percent of them have some persistent neurological side effects related to the infection, that's a lot of kids in an absolute basis. Uh, That's tragic. So that's what concerns a lot of public health officials and why we're trying to avoid mass infection in children. You said over the weekend that the best case scenario is that uh, Pfizer, for example, would have a vaccine for kids uh, 5 to 12 available by Halloween. Are you still optimistic about that? I think that's a best case. Um, Best case. You know, Pfizer will have data by the end of September. They'll be in a position to file within days of having the data set. Um, FDA has said that their review is going to be weeks, not months. I interpret that to mean a four to six week review. So in a best case scenario, Pfizer has the data at the end of September and is able to file by early October and it takes FDA four weeks to review the application. You could have it by the end of October. I think if things slip, maybe it becomes a mid-November event. But if all goes well, if the application supports the authorization, um, then you could have a vaccine available for kids ages five to 11 by Mm -hmm you know, beginning of October to uh, Hmm. mid-November, end of October to mid-November. Well, I can only hope so. Scott Gottlieb, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, 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 Scott Gottlieb is a former commissioner for the uh, the FDA, the author of a new incredibly important book, uh, Uncontrolled Spread, Why COVID-19 Crushed Us and How We Can Defeat the Next Pandemic. It's an incredibly valuable book, not just for telling us what went wrong, but uh, what we need to do for the next wave. So uh, Dr. Gottlieb, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Thanks for having me. And thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back tomorrow and we'll do this all over again.